Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramnan and with me as always, Shruti Mishra. These are the top headlines from the startup world. Mintra Marketplace has reported a bid up profit since the last quarter of CY23. Mintra said it has been growing notably faster than the online fashion market, with GMB growth nearing two times as a market during the recent festive season. E-commerce platform Misho is set to raise fresh capital from Tiger Global and SoftBank. Sources have confirmed to CNBC TV18. The investment details remain undisclosed. However, Money Control Report says that the firm is looking to raise $300 billion. Sources added that the fundraise is aimed at shifting Misho's domicile from Delaware to India. Subco Coffee Roasters, a specialty coffee and cocoa startup, has backed $10 million from Zero Das Nikhil Kamath. This funding round also witnessed participation from Bloom Founders Fund, the Gauri Khan Family Trust and actor John Abraham, among others. The Techpreneurs Association of Mumbai concluded its first ever elections and announced an eight-member governing council to be co-chaired by Dream11 co-founder Harsh Jain and Haptic co-founder Akrit Vesh for a two-year term starting April 1st. Indian startups saw venture capital investments slip in Q1 2024 with $1.6 billion raised in funding after continuous growth in the previous three quarters of 2023 as per data, data from Traction. Tinder owner Match Group named Instacart executive Laura Jones and Zillow co-founder Spencer Raskoff to its board this after talks with Elliott Investment Management to improve its performance. Well, those were the headlines we've been tracking for you this evening. Well, those were the headlines we've been tracking for you this evening. US-based venture capital firm Alphatron Capital, formerly known as SMK Ventures, has announced the closing of its first fund. The fund has been oversubscribed by 20%, closing at $30 million. As against the initial target of $25 million, the fund aims to provide access to a diversified pool of India's technology and tech-leveraged companies while minimizing entry barriers for U.S. investors. And to elaborate more, joining me now is Vishwesh Pai, the founding partner at Alphatron Capital. Vishwesh, welcome to Startup Street. And before we talk about your first fund, let's discuss your model. Alphatron Capital primarily operates as a fund of funds. You invest about 70 to 80 percent capital in about 10 to 15 VCs in India and the remaining to make direct company investments in the portfolio companies of the funds. Uh, you know, in fact, you've made 11 fund of fund investments and five special purpose vehicle or co-investments already. If you could talk to me about your investment thesis, how are you identifying and supporting tech-led funds and investment opportunities? First of all, thanks for having us on the call. We are super excited to uh, launch a first fund and close it way beyond what we started to. At a high level, our investment thesis is very straightforward. We are giving the best possible product for a US investor to have a diversified access to the India technology sector. And the way we do it is with a two-pronged strategy. One is our fund of fund strategy. We have already invested in 11 different funds based out of India, plus to give the extra mileage to our investors in US, we do co-invest along with these funds in various tech-based companies out of India. All right, Vishwesh, let me also congratulate you on closing your first fund. If you could tell us how many startups you're looking to invest in and what will the ticket size be and by when do you start investing? Yeah, great question. So we have already started investing directly in companies as well. We've already done two of these companies, which is Pixel, a space tech company mm. uh, based out of India and US. Second one is Homeville, where we are riding the Indian fintech wave in terms of diversifying the portfolio for investors. In terms of how many are gonna be, we invest, we're gonna go at least eight plus direct investments beyond our fund investments okay. in various sectors which are tech-based out of India. Our ticket sizes vary a lot. Uh, it can go up to $2 million depending on the right company we, we can invest. All right. The fund seems to be sector agnostic. But Vishwish, what areas are you looking at? Which sectors in technology are you betting big on? Yeah, so we are we are very much bullish on SaaS mm. and B2B SaaS and SaaS. All SaaS have, 
have now become AI SaaS. So definitely SaaS yeah. with AML focus. Uh, no company today uh, exists or should exist and focus beyond AI and Gen AI uh, trend. Definitely mm. very much bullish on that. Second is the fintech sector in India is very ripe. And there's a lot of investments like one we did in Homeville. We're going to do more of these in the future. Uh, beyond that, we are definitely looking at health tech, digital content uh, made for India in India, and also some of the D2, D2, D2C sectors. Okay. Uh, Vishesh, as I mentioned earlier, the fund aims to provide access to a diversified pool of India's uh, tech and tech leverage companies while also serving as a gateway for U.S. investors. If you could elaborate on the India sentiment, what is it that's attracting American investors to the Indian uh, startup growth story? Absolutely. Uh, if, you, if you're sitting, and I was in U.S. for 16 years, I moved to India recently, a year and a half back. But if you look at the sentiment and if you're sitting in a US uh, being Indian or uh, Desi or also non-Desis who are looking at the rapid growth of India's GDP overall, not just the tech sector, you're like, how can I diversify my portfolio by investing in Indian uh, companies, be it public facing and private. What we offer as a product is a unique product where you as a US investor sitting in US and you can invest in US dollars in the Indian private tech sector without going through the hassle of dealing with taxes and all those issues. We take care for the US investor, all of it from uh, start to end. Okay. Uh, they invest in dollars, they get their cavens, and they get their returns in US dollars. We take care of all of it, hmm. give you the broad exposure to whole of the India private tech sector as much as we can with our diversified uh, portfolio. Okay, Vishesh, as monetary action in the U.S. slows down and the as the Fed pauses, do you see more dollars coming in into Indian startups? Will this be the end of funding winter for the Indian startups? Uh, from our vantage point, absolutely. India okay. is one of the fastest big economy in the world. Uh, no matter how you slice and dice, there has to be more money flowing in from the U.S. to India in general and specifically to tech sector, which is the fastest growing sector in India. Uh, from our perspective. All right. Uh, before I let you go, one final question. Alphatron Capital claims that it conducts extensive due diligence on multiple funds in India, targeting those with the greatest growth potential. If you could elaborate on how you do this. And the second part of the question is, what are the criteria? And if you could guess, give us a sense of the funding outlook for the next two years. Great. Uh, I think there are two to three parts to it. So let me take step by step. Hmm. Our due diligence is very straightforward. We have a two, three prong approach. We definitely depend on the funds we've invested in to do the first level of due diligence. And that's how we co-invest through them. Second is we have a team locally based out of India, be it the finance side, the investment side in Bangalore, in uh, Mumbai and Gurgaon. Uh, so we do our detailed tech side as well as finance side and also all the other parts due diligence. And to your uh, second part, uh, where do we where do we uh, see going uh, in terms of the Indian sector? We're going to do more of more of these investments in the tech sector in India based on our strong due diligence framework and look at the strong ROI. Who can give us the highest growth with uh, minimum risk from the all the different angles? What we are seeing. All right. Okay. Uh, Vishesh, many thanks for joining us on Startup Street today. Uh, again, congratulations on the closing of your first fund and we'll definitely keep a track of all your investments. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having us. Look forward to it. Moving on, sustainability platform Tapfin, which focuses on providing a variety of services, including financing and insurance to startups and MSMEs, Within the sustainability ecosystem, backed $4 million in a seed funding round led by Elevar Equity. Founded in 2023, Tapfin, in addition to facilitating financing and insurance opportunities for companies in the sustainability space, also aims to create an ecosystem among these companies to offer services such as demand aggregation, market linkages, other value-added services. Joining us now on the hot seat is Taniza Berry, the co-founder and CEO of Tapfin. Taniza, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Now, you know, as I mentioned, you're a sustainability platform facilitating India's net zero ambitions. So you cater to MSMEs and startups in the clean mobility area. So talk to us about what's on offer. What's the business model at this point? Hi, Arundhati. Thank you for having us on the show. 
Uh, at Tapfin, we are building a technology-led full-stack platform that offers multiple solutions and propositions uh, to a very diverse set of participants in each vertical of sustainability. You know, given the nascency of this ecosystem, uh, we have adopted an ecosystem uh, approach wherein we want to go deep uh, in each vertical, build specialization, and then get all the participants of that ecosystem on the platform, offer them relevant solutions, and build their linkages. So we've launched uh, you know, our proposition with clean mobility uh, and financing and demand aggregation. Right. And uh, you raised $4 million a few weeks ago. So where will you spend that money? Any new offerings in the pipeline? Uh, yes. So first and foremost, of course, uh, this is going to be a huge enabler in us uh, you know, achieving our vision of creating India's leading sustainability platform. Uh, we plan to deploy these funds uh, to build out our technology and data capabilities. Uh, also increase a market presence uh, because, you know, sustainability adoption in India is going to be not just driven by metros, but also tier two and three cities and uh, hire the right set of people who believe in our vision. Uh, so, yes. All right. So a few things on your agenda there. You're currently only focusing on the clean mobility space, but you hope to enter solar and other renewable energy technologies as well. So how soon will we see this happen? What are the plans on this front? So like I mentioned, we believe in verticalization of each segment of sustainability. Uh, you know, we've already sort of set up the building foundation for the clean mobility platform on Tafwin. And very soon, we will actually also be venturing into solar. Of course, sustainability as an ecosystem is very vast. You know, you have circularity, you have clean agri-tech, you have water management, you have other renewable energy sources. So we will start building all of them uh, as we go along. So one at a time, so you will build them along the way. Now, you started in 2023. What's your revenue model? What are the revenues you're clocking at this point? And what are the targets for this year? Uh, you know, given the very early stage of Tafin, uh, our primary focus has been to get key ecosystem participants on the platform so far. Uh, like I mentioned, we've launched financing and demand aggregation proposition in the clean mobility space uh, through our partnership with top OEMs and leading banks and NBFCs in India. Now that you've started to build that out uh, and now we've been able to raise funds, we will now start building uh, our proposition out even deeper. And that's when we'll actually start seeing a lot more uh, you know, revenue uh, and possibly, yes, at that point in time, possibly I can answer your question better. Uh, all right. Now, um, you said finance and demand aggregation is what you're focusing on. You also have insurance offerings. Um, what's doing better? Where is the demand right now coming from? And what are the claims you've been able to see or facilitate or how much have you been able to uh, disburse at this point? So, uh, while, of course, if you look at our financing uh, MOUs that we've been able to sign, we already have about 80, 90 odd crores of requirements in the pipeline. Uh, insurance as a value proposition, as a value added service, along with roadside assistance, uh, extended warranties is something that we're going to launch very soon. All right. It's something you're going to launch soon. But, uh, you know, also talk to us about the client and clients you're currently catering to. Uh, you also hope to go deeper in tier two and three markets. So what's the opportunity here? I think the good news about sustainability is honestly the push from government, you know, it's positive signaling and the demand by the private sector. For us, the customer or a prospect is anyone and everyone. Uh, let's say we started with clean mobility. So in the EV ecosystem, now this could be a fleet uh, operator, a cab aggregator, a charging point operator, battery manufacturer, dealership, OEM, anyone for whom we can unlock income uh, or economic and entrepreneurial potential. Those are our customers. Right. So those are your customers. Now, sustainability is a huge thing and everybody is talking about it. So what's the opportunity you see and what is the trend that you're currently seeing, especially with clean mobility? So you do see growth. Of course, it's happening in silos, which is, again, a huge opportunity for a platform like ours, you know, which wants to enable the ecosystem by offering multiple propositions that cater to all requirements. For sustainability itself, uh, there are reports that indicate uh, India will need more than $2 trillion investment by 2030 itself. And that money, that investment, that delivery of services is not going to happen through conventional means and approaches, which is, again, a huge opportunity for new age players like us. 
Right. And, you know, speaking about uh, the opportunity here, also, by when do you hope to start making money? What is the plan looking like going forward? Uh, right now, I think the focus for us is really build out both proposition and keep getting participants, build those linkages. Uh, so, yes, I mean, and that is what we want to start with clean mobility. In a few months, you'll see us live in solar. Every vertical will have very contextual offerings as well as revenue models. Uh, you know, for example, in clean mobility, you will have a customer who only needs financing. There's another customer who needs demand aggregation. In solar, you may have a customer who needs financing, but a different uh, sort of EPC proposition that we need to build out there. So every vertical, a different revenue stream, a different model, uh, a different proposition set. Some, of course, could be common. All right. And, uh, you know, how do you plan to take on the big boys in the sector at this point? How do you plan to take on competition? Uh, you know, the challenge of nascency of the ecosystem is honestly our biggest opportunity as well. Today, uh, the sector itself, barring a few large players, uh, which are, let's say, offering one or two services, this entire segment is being driven by MSMEs and startups and households. Now, a platform that wants to bring together all participants where you can connect users of services with providers of services, uh, you know, under one roof. I think to us, that opportunity is a fairly innovative way of delivering a solution, which is yet to be seen in the market. All right, Aniza, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We're completely out of time and we wish you all the best in building your uh, company at this point. Thank you so much, Arundhati. It was a pleasure. All right, on that note, it's time for us to head into a short break. But coming up, Piggy's Burger raises a pre-series A round at a valuation of 210 crore rupees. We check in with the company's founder to understand their group plans. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still with us on Startup Street. Funding winter continues for Indian startups. According to a report by Traction, Indian startups saw venture capital investments slipped during the first quarter of 2024, with a total of $1.6 billion raised until the 15th of March. Despite the slump, the quarter witnessed a silver lining as early-stage funding witnessed an increase of 28%, while late-stage funding saw a huge drop of over 46%. Akhil Vishwanath is here with those details. Akhil? There were some signs of spring for the Indian startup ecosystem as 2023 came to a close, but 2024 is proving to be tough. Venture capital investments have slipped to $1.6 billion in the first three months of this year and undone the surge seen over the last two quarters. VC investments had inched up from $1.6 billion in Q2 2023 to $1.9 billion in Q3 2023 and $2.2 billion in Q4 2023. When we look at late stage wise trends, late stage startups continue to suffer with a significant drop in funding of over 46% from $1.6 billion in Q4 2023 to $670 million in Q1 2024. But despite the slump, the quarter witnessed some silver linings. Firstly, early stage funding witnessed a notable increase of 28%. Secondly, shadow facts and credit size on led the return of a few hundred billion dollar rounds. Thirdly, the quarter saw the emergence of two new unicorns, Perfios and Ola Krutrim. And lastly, on the sectoral front, fintech and enterprise tech both saw strong investor interest, registering a 50% uptick in funding in the January to March period. On the investor front, venture catalysts, we found a circle and Titan Capital led the seed investments in Q1 2024, while Peak15, Sama Capital and RTB, Glo RTB Global were prominent in early stage investments. Elevate, Epic Capital Advisors and UCRNT Fund took the lead in the late stage category in the previous quarter. 
talking about exit, or exit opportunities, eight tech companies went public, including Media Assist, WGI, Exicom, and Law Seco. However, there were fewer mergers and acquisitions. Overall, there were just 20 acquisitions during the quarter, a 33% decrease from last quarter, and a 55% drop compared to 45 acquisitions in Q1 2023. Back to you. Thank you, Akhil, for those details. Appreciate you joining us. Moving on, a few weeks ago, QSR startup Biggie's Burger announced its pre-Series A round at a valuation of 210 crore rupees. Now, the company tells CNBC TV18 it will secure its first complete round of funding by June, even as it plans a four-fold revenue growth by FY26. Jude Sanit does a deep dive into Beamer Brands, which owns the Biggie's Burger chain, and finds out how the company is adding a touch of local spice to American fast food. Take a look. With 124 QSR outlets and an ongoing expansion blitzkrieg, Biggie's Burger and its sister brand, Big Guys, believe they can take on the likes of KFC and Burger King in India. The first checkpoint to getting there is a revenue of 400 crore rupees by FY26. This means Bima Brands has two years to quadruple its present day revenues that stand at just over 100 crore rupees. Founder and CEO Biraja Raut believes expanding his outlets across South India is a sure shot route to getting there. So for the 400 crore target, we are tra trying to achieve a 350 to 380 stores. So, for, to support that uh, growth rate, uh, we have Biggie's Burger, which will be giving 200 to 250 stores. And we have created a subsidiary brand of ours, uh, which is like Big Guy's Wings, whose primary products are into Indianized flavored fried chicken. So, we, we do have products like Gunpowder Chicken, Indian Tarka Chicken. So, in that brand, we are planning to channelize another 50 to 100 stores. So, cumulative Biggie's and Big Guy's and some acquisitions that are on the talks, I believe um, will be will be will be on the go of uh, 400 CR target. Beamer Brands, which owns Biggie's Burger and Big Guy's Wings, says it's eyeing a Series A round that it hopes to close by June. The QSR startup says it expects to raise between 40 and 50 crore rupees, which it will then use to activate its store expansion roadmap spanning the next two years. This means investing in manpower to open these 200 stores in 20 months which is every three days one store, we need a decent amount of team at the back end. We need to do good amount of marketing. So I believe my 90% of the budget or the fund that I'm raising in the next two rounds will be invested back into building my team and marketing the concept and the brand. Beamer Brand says its 400 crore rupee revenue projections will see its burger offerings clock a top line of 250 crore rupees, while its fried chicken product will account for another 120 crore rupees. The rest, it says, will be accounted for by acquisitions. Beyond market expansion, though, the company says curating a distinct Indian flavour for its fried chicken is its X factor. The coastal region of India made by Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, we consume a lot of amount of chicken. But uh, there is no indigenous flavour towards the fried chicken. So with a vision of creating Indian's own fried chicken concept, we have launched this brand called Big Guys. And I believe uh, we'll be substantially uh, successful to fill this gap of KFC and nothing in some time. So expansion aside, it's a whole lot of flavor that will see Biggies and Big Guys take on bigger names in the Indian QSR segment. But the trick will be in how well it manages to compete with competition who have deep pockets keep the taste and pocket-conscious Indian consumer interested and standardize supply chain and quality to keep growth on track. In Chennai, Jude Sanat. And with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Startup Street. More news and updates continue on the other side. Stay tuned.